A lot of people in this modern day uh, talks a lot about how to have order in the church, um, and it talks about how to direct yourself. Uh, tonight we're going to get into some of the things that were really the downfall of the Jewish people, which, which led to like a, a religion. It was like this man-made religion, the very religion that rejected their Messiah, um, and so the church fell. So when Messiah showed up, they rejected their Messiah because of their man-made religion instead of a God-centered religion that was, that was a worship of God from the heart. It all became very intellectual, uh, very external and mental, uh, uh, soulish, and, and uh, about rules and laws and, and keeping rules and laws by the flesh. And they're missing the heart of the matter, and so they missed Christ. And so what happens uh, once Jesus comes? Did, did we learn our lesson? Well, we fell right back into the same trap of, of intellectualism and man's religion. And so we enter into what's known as the Dark Ages for, for like 1,500 years or more. Uh, and, and so we, this could have been prevented by simply listening to this part of the Bible, paying close attention what Paul is talking about here in uh, 1 Corinthians, particularly the first few chapters, in fact, he's, he, re, he repeats himself so many times, it becomes kind of overwhelming. It's like, okay, Paul, we get it. So uh, forgive me if I repeat myself a lot tonight. I'm just rehearsing what Paul is doing because he is really trying to hammer home a point. And, and if you know church history, like I just repeated, you can understand why is the church always tends towards getting back into the flesh back into not following God from the heart, but making it a bunch of rules, a bunch of laws, and really a bunch of intellectualism of, of, of uh, trying to show how, how uh, smart they are, how intelligent they are, and things like that. And so they miss God completely. So uh, picking up last time, pastor left off at uh, chapter 1, Verse 17, which is talking about baptism for, and of course Paul wrote this, he said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, right? Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made, made of none effect. And we know what the gospel is. It is the glad tidings, the good news, all right? So we know that uh, Paul was preaching the good news, and this is the, the most, one of the most important scriptures when you're trying to talk to people that say, oh, you have to be water baptized to be saved. There's so many people that actually believe that. All you got to do is show them this scripture. This scripture makes it clear. Paul said, I wasn't told to go around and baptize people. I'm told to preach the gospel because it's the gospel, the preaching of the gospel that saves people. People just believe and they're saved. It's not believe plus get water baptized. Okay. You should get water baptized, but that's not what saves you. You get water baptized because you're already saved. So uh, Christ sent me not to baptize. That would be the opposite of the Great Commission. If in the Great Commission we were required to get people baptized to save them. So Christ sent me not to get people water baptized because baptism, water baptism does not save people. What saves people? It's the preaching of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Right? Lest the cross, so he talks about, but this is what I want to get into because I had to say verse 17 to get into the context of what I'm covering in verse 18. He says, not with wisdom of words. And this is where it, it, it gets really messed up. Uh, Paul was brought up under Gamaliel. He was a, a great rabbi, a great Jewish scholar. And so he was like at the top of the class of the highest Jewish, the highest uh, uh, school and all of, of, you know, all of the land. And t Paul was like, you know, he was a, a very smart person, a very sh strong intellectually. And, and basically, uh, he, he was brought up as the cream of the crop. He was, you know, going to basically, he was being groomed to run the whole thing, you know, the, re the Jewish religion kind of thing. He was, he was that great, that smart intellectually. Uh, but Paul rejected all that. Paul said that all, I can't, all that stuff is dung, he talks about. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, scholars and, and even uh, Bible scholars, they'll, they'll put all their degrees all over the walls. 
And, and what Paul would have said is all you got on your wall is, is, is a bunch of dung. I count all that as dung. It's not about how much knowledge I have. It's not about all these external things and schooling. And, and, and you know, there's benefits in these things. Don't get me wrong. We, we should gain knowledge. We should go to school if we can. We should gain all the, the knowledge that we can. But that's not what this is about. It's really about a heart matter of seeking God by faith. And so uh, the Bible talks about knowledge puffs up. You know, the accumulation of knowledge has uh, uh, an effect on the human uh, carnal mind that it puffs up man. And so what, what was created, again, was a religion created by man. It, it is basically, uh, I know more than you. I'm, therefore, I'm, I'm better than you. You need to listen to what I have to say. And that's kind of how the, the Jew, Jewish scholars and scribes and Pharisees saw themselves as these super intellectuals and, and all the, the people were just common peons and they didn't have any education and they, they didn't know anything. And, and so you just do what I say. And, that's, and, and so we fall into the same trap again with Roman Catholicism. Uh, it, it became Roman Catholicism became the, the intellectuals and they were the scholars and they knew the, the Bible and you didn't. In fact, they, they made sure you didn't know the Bible. They kept it out of the common language they kept the Bible out of your hands. They, they burned people when they tried to give people uh, uh, the Bibles. And so the, the, they, they, were, they had like a monopoly on religion so the people couldn't come to God. And God hated that. And I, it's amazing that, that the church fell right back into that same trap. But, you know, Jesus condemned these very people. He says, you know, you, you are a child of, of hell and you create basically disciples that are twice as much the child of hell that you were. And so this is what God hates. He, he hates uh, a man's religion. And so this is really the essence of where it's going. He, he, Paul talks about uh, words, uh, wisdom of words. In other words, there were those that uh, were, were um, particularly in the Greek area that he was at. They're in Corinth, and, and you know, that, there's a strong Greek influence, of course. And so th they were all about wisdom of words. They were, they were sophists. They, were, they believed in, in wisdom, but it wasn't God's wisdom. It's, it's this man's wisdom and philosophy and logic and uh, Plato and Socrates and all these philosophers and all that kind of stuff. So that was the big thing back then. And so he's saying, I am not coming with that. I am not coming with man's logic, man's religion, man's intelligence, nothing of man. God has rejected that. That is unpleasing to him. Uh, and so uh, he, he, what does he come with? Well, I come not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Why? Because uh, then you could say, look what I've done. You could, you could say, you know, look how smart I am. That's why you should follow me. That nobody, no preacher, no minister should ever make disciples of themselves. It is not about following the, the, the preacher. Well, he looks good and he can speak well and he is a great orator and, and man, he, he must be a great man of God. No, that's stupid. That's the opposite of the conclusions. Is that, but, but so many Christians are so carnal and, and so immature that they don't, they don't realize that. It, it's not about oratory and it's not about man's wisdom and intellect. Uh, it's, it's about having faith in Jesus Christ from the heart. And so it's about preaching this here, the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ. And then he goes on to talk about for because, for or because, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is, it is the power of God. I mean, if you think about it, we, we have uh, a, a man, he, he was... Think about this from an intellectual standpoint, a logical standpoint, if this makes any sense. A man was born of a virgin who died. And the Christians believe somehow that that's victorious. Logically, that makes no sense. How is there anything beneficial in a, in a man dying how is that going to help you, <laughs> right? That doesn't make any sense to the logical mind. And so the, the logical mind rejects that. And, and you know, because, uh, you know, hey, there's been all kinds of men that died. What, what made this, this Jesus guy so special? 
And so logic rejects that. And you can say, well, he, he resurrected. And then they'll go, okay, he's resurrected. Where is he? Oh, well, he's, he's in heaven. Oh. And they reject it right there because they can't see. Well, you show me, then I'll believe. See? That's, that's how the world works. That's how logic works. They, the scientific method has, you know, experimentation, and, and then you have to see and observe to, to, to make a conclusion, you know? And so uh, the, the logical mind is contrary or resistant to the things of faith. For because the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, it's foolishness. It just doesn't make sense. So the preaching of the cross, and that's, that's what Paul was doing. He's preaching the cross everywhere he went, and that's how people are saved. But it's, it's the preaching of the cross. Well, number one, they didn't have what you have probably sitting in your lap or on your phone or wherever it may be. They didn't have a New Testament. Uh, and, and so we thank God we have a New Testament. But the only way they actually got the message is that somebody come and preach to them the message. And so many, many years later, until we compiled what we know as our New Testament, which is uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it was particularly in the preaching that people learned the truth of the gospel. And so uh, unto the world, the, 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 the Jewish rabbis, as well as the Greek philosophers, it's foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How do we know that? It's only by faith. It's only by faith. We are saved by faith alone. And so this is the thing that separates uh, really the, the, the great intellectual and the, the rabbis and the scholars and, and, and all these great men in the world is it's, it's by faith. That's how God can separate his people from the people of the world. Because only the people that will humble themselves as much as a little child and just believe a story that Jesus died on that cross for our sins and rose again the third day. And if you have faith in him, you shall be saved. If you can just believe that like a child, you'll be saved. It's amazing that all the, all the books written, that, that, that you can think of any book in the world, there's no book like the Bible. And that a child can just hear that story and believe it, and the intellectual will reject it. You can think of any other book in the world that a child can understand and read, the intellectual can also understand it and read it. But the Bible requires that one thing, which is faith. We believe that Jesus died again, rose, rose from the grave, and has ascended to the Father. And he's coming back again. He was born of the Virgin Mary. And, and this is all things that we believe. These are the foundations of Christianity. So, and that all comes only through that one thing called faith. So it is faith that separates us. And so when you, you ever find yourself drifting away, drifting into intellectualism and into uh, logic and, and these kinds of things, you need to be very, very careful because you could be drifting away from your faith. The preaching of the cross is to them that, that perish, it's foolishness. But unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. Praise God. The cross is the power of God. It is the, the, the supernatural power that resurrects us. We were dead, spiritually speaking, we were dead for all of eternity, destined for our lake of fire, but now in Christ we become alive. Okay? That it is the power of God. That's the greatest miracle that God has ever done is through Jesus Christ resurrecting us from death unto life. It is the power of God so that we could be saved. And so when it talks about, you know, Paul was preaching the cross, that doesn't mean he went around and saying the cross, the cross, the cross. You know, obviously that's a, a reference to the gospel of Jesus Christ, how uh, he was our substitution on that cross for our sins. And of course he died and rose again, and by our faith in him we can be saved. And so he, he didn't just go, and he wasn't talking about the, the wood, you know. Uh, we understand that that's a reference to, to what Jesus did through, uh, what God did through Jesus Christ. So it, it, it talks about, but unto us which are saved. And uh, I found some really interesting thing, uh, uh, information about being, being saved. In Robertson's word pictures, this phrase, are saved, is actually uh, better translated, are being saved. So we're in the, in other words, it's a process. It's not like 
you, you got saved like it's like you just walk through a door. There's much, much more to it. It's not only just an event that happened in our past, though it did do that. We did have that moment, at least I hope we all have, where, where we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior by our faith. Uh, so it is an event that happened in the past. It says in Romans 8.24, we were saved. So there was that event where we were saved. Um, and then it is, a, it is also a present state of, as it says in Ephesians 2.5, you have been saved. So it's something that happened in the past. It's our present state right now. But it's also a process. You are being saved, which this verse is talking about. That's what our saved actually translates to. It's a process. It's not just something in the past and something present, but it's also like a path, not just a door, but can, imagine it as a path that we continually walk every single day, the, the walk of faith. You can find that also in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, that it is a process. And then, of course, there's also our future salvation, thou shalt be saved in Romans 10, 9, talking about the full redemption that takes place of not only our spirits, which has already happened, and our soul, which is in the process, but also our body when he returns back again at the, the resurrection and the rapture. And so that will complete the salvation so there's, there's a salvation also of the future. So it's something that happened in the past, and it is also a present state, which is also a process, which is also a future thing that we look forward to. That is our salvation. Let's keep going. Verse 19, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. Verse 19 then says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of God. The prudent. This is a, a quote out of Isaiah 29. In fact, I'll go ahead and read Isaiah 29. This is in Isaiah 29, verse 13. He says, so, so why, did, why did God do this? Why, I mean, think about it. Why would God try to hide something? It's like he's hiding it from certain people. He's, he's hiding it for those, from those whose heart is not right with him is what he's doing. And so when you come to that place of humility and crying out to God and, and I need you, you humble yourself, then you'll see. Your eyes will be open and you'll see this. So who's he hiding it from? Well, he tells us over there where this is quoted in Isaiah 29, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips they do honor me, but, uh, but have removed their hearts from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of, of men. So why is the Jewish people, and we can see it in even modern Christianity and Roman Catholicism and so forth, is they're, they're going through the motions. They're doing it with their lips. They're giving God lip service, but there's been no change. There's nothing that's changed in their heart. In fact, I preached on it this last, last time I preached. If there's a real conversion, your heart will be changed, and there would be fruit. There would be something manifested in your life that other people could see that there's a change. There's love, there's joy, there's peace, there's righteousness, there's sanctification, there's, there's the walk of, of walking in truth and, and self-discipline and all these different things. And so there's an outward change that takes place. But because their hearts weren't right, they didn't let the word get into their heart. And so God is actually hiding the truth from them. In other words, the, the gospel is being presented to them, and they are rejecting it because their hearts were not right. And therefore, back to Isaiah 29, it says in verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among these people, even a marvelous work, you know, Jesus, marvelous, and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid or hidden. It's amazing how, how God can do a marvelous work, signs, wonders, and miracles. The ministry of Jesus Christ was so supernatural, and they want to kill the guy. They, they want to put him on a cross. I mean, he said, if you don't believe me, believe it for the work's sake. And they couldn't even do that. Their hearts were so waxed over with religion and pride that, that they would actually call the Prince of Glory, they called him the Prince of Flies, the, 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 
Beelzebub, you know. They, they called him a devil. That's what religion does to you. You don't want anything to do with man's religion. You want, you want the real true religion, which is uh, from the heart, faith in Jesus Christ. And when you have it, you're, you're going to have an outward evidence. There's going to be a change that takes place. So he says he will destroy these people. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and, bring, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? The Pharisees. Where are the scribes? Talking about the, the Jewish uh, theologians, these guys that would just sit there and study the law all day long, study the scriptures about the Messiah, but when he shows up, reject him. They were hair splitters over the law. They, they, you know, as Jesus said, they'd swallow a camel and strain at a gnat. Where are the disputers of this world? Well, they were in Greek land. The, the, the Greek influence was there. So he's talking about the philosophers. I, I took philosophy class in uh, college, and whew, that was a mess. It was, it was horrible. It, it was so ungodly. Um, don't, don't ever take philosophy if you can help it. That's just my, my advice. Where are the disputers of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? God talks about them also in Romans 1.22. He says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Their minds were given over, over to darkness. And so we see a world that's like this. We see even, you know, this is talking about re initially uh, religious people, people that claim to follow God and believe in God, and their minds were darkened, and they were given over unto lasciviousness and, and all these other things. It talks about homosexuality in Romans chapter 1 um, and I think bestiality and, and horrible things like that because their minds were darkened because their hearts were not right. The, the greatest advice I could give to, even to Christians that we need to be careful of, don't get proud, but always keep a humble heart because any one of us, we're susceptible to this. This is, this is talking about warning Paul is warning, and, and the Holy Ghost through Paul is warning people that are already believers in God. If you were to ask these people, do they believe in God? Of course they all would. All the Jewish men, the rabbis, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all these guys, they would all believe in God. And then God gives us that warning again over there in Romans chapter 1, uh, uh, professing to be wise, they became fools. They, they know of God through creation, and yet they started to worship the creation instead of the creator. And their minds were darkened. And so the, the most important thing for anybody, no matter how much knowledge you gain in God or God's word or how long you've walked with the Lord, always keep a humble heart. Just, God, I am depending on you for everything. My next breath, I, I get on my face before you and say, God, show me any foolishness where I am depending on my strength and my wisdom, my intellect, my money, my ability, and, and let me cast all that aside like Paul says and, cast, and call it all as dung, as nothing. That is a true spiritual, spiritual person, not someone that relies on how smart they are and how intellectual or how powerful and rich or whatever it is. They come from a uh, a, a, a noble background or whatever it is, but, but their faith is in God realizing that they are weak. They are nothing. I, I don't know if I said it Sunday, but there's a set of scriptures that I like, I like to point out, and one of them says, I can do nothing. In fact, that was my main scripture. I can do nothing. You know, we're, Jesus is divine. We are the branches, but we can do nothing without him. He's the source of our life. We literally can do nothing. We, we are nothing, another scripture says. We can do nothing. We have nothing, another scripture says. There's a, so there's like four scriptures. I have nothing, I can do nothing, I know nothing was the other one, and I am nothing. That's the four. And uh, I can give you those if you want them. Um, but it, it, we should stay in a place of humility. And when we watch the ministry of Paul, he, when he was, you know, he, he says he was a sinner, and then later on, at the end of his ministry, he, he not only says he's a sinner, he says, I am the chief of sinners. The, the older he, he got, the more he walked with the Lord, the more humble he became over time, realizing 
that if I don't stay humble, I can get puffed up in pride. And I get puffed up in pride. I mean, Paul had a, I mean, there, there would have been some issues. Paul had, had apparently already been to heaven. Paul had already been resurrected from the dead. Paul had supernatural miracles that he was performing. And, had, and of course, the revelation, he wrote nearly three quarters, two thirds to three quarters of our New Testament. He was having revelation like no one has ever had before. Uh, the revelation uh, through, uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, like no one's ever had. And so he had great temptation, I believe, that he had to deal with in being puffed up and proud. And he came from that as his background. He was a Jewish rabbi, and he came from a place of great knowledge and, and great schools and great teachers. And, and so he had to really deal with that. And so it, it took him like 14 years in the desert to get all the junk out of himself, God dealing with him, the Holy Ghost dealing with him, to get to a place where he can finally be used and start preaching the gospel in truth and in humility. But he, he, he didn't just start that way. He, he grew in his humility. And that's what I want to be. I, grow in the Lord means you, you realize the more I know, the more I don't know. The more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. The, the more I realize I don't know, the more I get on my face and say, God, help me. You know, how great is this, is this message that you've, you've given to me and, and this ministry that you've given to me? And we all have a ministry. We all have a calling. And so over time, we should, we should get on our face all the more dependent on God. Keep going. Verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God... The world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that, what? That believe. It's by faith. For the Jews required a sign. The Greeks seek, seek after wisdom. And so, again, this is Paul emphasizing the same point. The truth of the gospel is not revealed by intellect. We, we cannot in any way point to uh, man's ability, man's intellect, man's strength, man's, the flesh of man, the arm of man. It is all by God. Even, even the revelation for us to, to be saved, it's a revelation that came to us by the Holy Ghost. We can't even take credit for that. God, sa God loved us before we loved him. God saved us before the foundation of the world, before we even know that we needed to be saved. So man can never take credit in any way for his salvation. God says he will not give his glory to another. We, we cannot take the glory of God upon ourselves. That's a very, very dangerous thing to do. And so uh, the way God uh, does it is through, the, the as he says, the, the foolishness of preaching the, the, the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's through the foolishness of preaching. So he says, um, by the foolishness of preaching, though, save them that believe. So we have really two, two types of people here. We have uh, kind of the, the intellectual, and then we got those that believe. We got those that will uh, not humble themselves, and then we got those that will humble themselves. And so when we humble ourselves like a child, we can enter into the kingdom of God. One commentator, commentator said this, Paul is saying that, those who operate in the world's wisdom don't find much of a place in God's kingdom. It's not because God won't have them. It's because they won't have God. Their own reasoning will keep them from receiving the simplicity of the gospel. So God is, is making the call. He's making the invite to all. But only those whose hearts are ready will re even respond. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks after, seek after uh, wisdom. And, and, you know, the signs are fine, are fine, but the problem was that they wanted the sign before they would believe. But that's not how it works. That's tempting God. I want to see before I believe. But, but God requires faith. It's faith that pleases God, it says in, in Hebrews 11.6. Faith is what God requires to be saved. So... Verse 23, it says, but we preach Christ crucified. Again, totally illogical. How can a man dying on a cross save? What is, you know, they don't just preach 
Christ, you know, that, that, that could be good. You know, it's the Messiah, the Messiah. That's what Christ means. But it's him being crucified. I'm, Christ being crucified, Christ dying. What, how, how is that victorious? How does that help anybody, right? It's illogical. But we, but he kept preaching it. And whether, whether the people liked it, the Jews liked it, the Greeks didn't like it, it, it made no sense. They had no understanding, but he just kept preaching it anyway. For those few that's, whose hearts were right, they would get it. But we preach or proclaim Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. <laughs> Again, uh, they, they were studying the scriptures, uh, memorizing huge portions of the Bible, looking for the Messiah. When he showed up, they crucified him. He was a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, he is foolishness because they can't see. They want to see him. They, they want to see a sign. They want to see something happening, happening before they believe. Now, God, when the preaching of the word does take place, God does confirm his word with signs following. That's what it says in uh, uh, Mark chapter 16. I think it's verse, verse 15. He says he confirmed the word with signs following. So God will confirm the word as long as the word is being preached, the word of Christ, the word of the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, he will confirm, but the signs follow. The word comes first. If you don't believe the word, uh, even if someone were resurrected from the dead, they won't believe because their hearts were not right. So you, when your heart is right, you'll believe the word if it's the word all by itself. Stand alone all by itself. That's all you need to believe. I don't have to have a sign to believe. I don't have to have goosebumps. I don't have to have feelings to believe. That's someone whose heart is right. But someone whose heart is not right is I've got I've to have a sign. I've got to have a, 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 a visitation or something. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This word called, according to Thayer's, it means called means invited, as in being invited to a, to a banquet. It means invited by God in the proclamation of the gospel to obtain eternal salvation. It also means called to some, tor some type of office or divinely selected and appointed. So again, the problem is, is not that God isn't calling everyone. He is calling everyone. For God so loved the world. He's calling the whole world to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, there's also the response. In other words, we have, like I talked about Sunday, a free will. We have to use our free will to respond to the gospel so that we can uh, be saved. So we have to exercise our volition, our free will, and say, I need that. I've got to be saved. I'm a sinner. I see that I'm a sinner, and I'm heading for damnation. So Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the, the problem is not with the calling side. God is calling all. It's the response. In other words, just because you've been invited doesn't mean you've answered the call. Someone might invite you to a wedding, and that doesn't mean that, that you've been to the wedding, right? You have to actually go and show up. You have to respond. So it says here that the gospel is the power of God. And he, he kind of repeats this in different ways in this section so he's already said, the gospel is the power of God. Uh, over there in, in Romans chapter 1, the gospel is the power of God. What? To save. So he says it here. It is also the wisdom of God. So we see the, the contrast between the wisdom of the world, the intellectual, those that seem to be great, great in the eyes of men versus the wisdom of God, which is a spiritual wisdom. And so... He, he, he'll point out here that uh, the, the, the two types of people are drastically different. Okay, let me keep going. I'll, I'll get to that. Verse 25 says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. And this is the verse I was talking about. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh and not many mighty not many noble are called. Talking about flesh. So he's, again, this is making the contrast between, uh, you know, when, if, if, man, if, if man was in control of something, he's going to gather together like the cream of the crop. 
If he has to, to, to build a business or build a company or something, he's going to get the greatest, the smartest, the most intellectuals. That his, that's his greatest chance of having success. He wants the best of the best of the best so that he can, he can uh, uh, propagate his message and, and produce or serve or whatever it is he wants to do. But God did just the opposite. <laughs> he gets the lowest of the low. He, gets, he says, not many wise, not in, in, in the natural realm, uh, not these intellectuals, not these scholars, not these people with money and, and power and riches. Uh, these are not the people that God, that, that respond to God. That's really what it's about. It's the response to God. These people are the people that are overturning the whole world, are the lowly, the meek, the uneducated, the poor. You know, God can't use a, a, some great intellectual or some great movie star more than he can use a beggar that just got saved. He, that, that beggar that just got saved can become one of the greatest preachers this world has ever known. And he's never had an education. And some, and some of the most powerful men of God had virtually no education whatsoever, but they operate in great preaching and power and, and authority and have done mighty, mighty works in the earth. And so it's, it's certainly not about what man would consider to be great. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. If you, if you think about it on a scale, and, 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 and Paul, I think he's being a bit sarcastic here. He's, he's saying that men, their perception of the gospel is it seems foolish. So that's why he's talking about the foolishness of God. In, in, in man's perception, it seems the gospel is foolish. So he's saying, even if it is foolish, it's still wiser than you. <laughs> if there is a, a scale where you have the, 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 the most uh, uneducated man to the most educated intellectual man ever, if there's a scale, he's saying even beyond, beyond the, the most intellectual man, God is infinitely beyond that, even in, at the most foolish thing of preaching this gospel. So even if it is foolish, it's far beyond man's wisdom, man's intellectualism, man's knowledge. The weakness of God is stronger than man. Not that God is foolish and God is not weak. However, he chose to become weak when he chose to become a man. He, he, he died on that cross in weakness, but only by choice, right? He, he wasn't ever actually weak. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, 4, he was crucified through weakness, yet he, he lives by the power of God. One commentator said this, he was so crucified under, under conditions of humanity and its physical limitations, which he had chosen to assume and submit to. He died as part of the emptying of himself. So he is uh, the great God that has all power, and he chose to limit himself to become a man to die on that cross. But even that far surpasses anything that man can do to save himself. Man cannot save himself. Man's idea of saving himself usually is uh, try to be a good person, try to do good things, try to be you know a nice uh, a nice person and. You know, as long as I didn't murder anybody or rape or steal or anything like that, I'm, I'm probably okay with God because God is good. You know, see how that, that's the worldly logic. There's, there's something that's, that, there's a salvation that seems right to man, but the way they're in, the, the end thereof is absolute death. It is, it is nothing to do with how good you've been. <clears throat> because all the good stuff you do doesn't outweigh the sin. The problem is the sin problem. And none of that logic deals with the sin problem. Only Jesus, the Son of God dying on that cross, deals with the sin problem. And that's what we always need to remember, is to remind people, hey, I'm glad you're, you're a good person, but what about the sin? Oh, God, God will let that go. As if you know, God weighs it on a scale. If my good deeds outweigh my bad ones, my sins, I'll probably be okay. Do you really want to... Stake your entire eternity on that logic. I would rather stake it on, well, what does the Bible actually say? <laughs> I, I don't want to just, and, and people really don't know what the Bible says. That's really how they think. The world really thinks like that. I would rather 
check it out rather than to stake my eternity on that flimsy logic. Well, if my good deeds outweigh my bad, I'm, I'm probably all right. They're on their way to hell, and they don't know it. We've got to get this gospel out, right? Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. You see this, this theme, he keeps repeating it over and over. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. How many times has he said that? And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Hallelujah. Even, even babes and children can be saved under God's system. It's amazing. Amazing. Children can be saved, but the, the most intellectual, smart adult is a million miles away from God because they can't believe it. It's too simple, I guess you could say. The gospel is it's too simple. All you've got to do is believe. It has nothing to do with your works and what you've done. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised has God chosen Yea, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. In our notes it says, not many wise are going to make it because God has chosen the foolish things of this world. Not many mighty are going to make it because God has chosen the weak things of this world. He chooses the foolish, the weak, and not many noble because God has chosen the base things of this world which are despised. We, I mean, you, I look at the, the picture of the rich man and Lazarus. You got the rich man, he had it all in this life. He was the greatest in this life, you know, in, in men's estimation. And, and he, he had a poor beggar that he wouldn't even look down upon. He wouldn't even look at him. The dogs would lick his sores. He was, he was, and then the beggar is lifted up and exalted, and the rich man is burning for eternity. What a contrast. That's, that's what's going to happen. That's what we need to realize. You know, th this is serious. The gospel is serious. This is the most important thing that's happening in the earth is that we get this truth out. We've got to tell people the truth. They are under a deception. They're under, under a delusion that all you, know, you got to do is try to be good, believe you know, that God exists, try to be a good person, go to church. You know, and, and that is a, a delusion. That there, there has to be a reckoning. There has to be something to deal with with the problem of sin. And there's only one solution, there's only one way, and that, is, of course, is Jesus. Luke uh, 12, 51 says, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. And so when the gospel is preached, we see, again, people naturally will divide into two groups. Uh, you know, when, when Jesus was born, people think, well, you know, Jesus... If the baby in the manger, peace on earth, goodwill towards man. Uh, you know, <laughs> the peace is for those that actually respond to the gospel. It isn't peace for everybody. It's actually a division between light and darkness. Br Jesus brings a sword that divides. You'll see a division you probably already have in your household between those that believe in your family and those that don't. And so there's this, this constant division until... Those that don't believe are humbled. Unfortunately, that's what it takes is, is sometimes some circumstances that would humble them. Let's keep going. Verse 29 then says, that, that or so that no flesh should glory in his presence. Again, it's nothing about what we did. It has to be 100% about what Jesus accomplished on that cross. He finished that work. Why? So no one can glory and say, I did it. I worked my way up to heaven. I was, I was smarter. I studied the Bible more. I, was, I did more good works. I fasted harder. I prayed harder. I, I went to church more. It has nothing to do with us. No flesh should glory in his presence. And so that was the religion of man, of the Jewish people. And it switched and became Catholicism and 
It's about doing good works and you can do penance and you can pay to get into heaven or you can pay to get your people in purgatory into heaven. I mean, just a bunch of nonsense. It's, it, is, it is really blasphemous because you are, you, are, you are saying the power of Jesus Christ on the cross was not enough. We have to add to it. I have to do some stuff. You're, you're, you're blaspheming the cross by adding good works to it. You have to have faith in Christ alone. His work completed it all. Hallelujah. And to add to it is, is, is wicked. But of him, him being the Father, are you in Christ Jesus. So of the Father are you. Once you're in Christ, you're of the Father, is what he's trying to say. Who of God has made unto us wisdom. So the who is Jesus again. So we're of the Father once we get in Christ. And Christ is made for us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In fact, he, he repeats this a part about being wisdom. Um, he's already said that earlier as well. So he's emphasizing Jesus is our wisdom. Now we have the, the spiritual wisdom, the true wisdom, which comes from heaven, not man's wisdom, and righteousness. We know 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, he made him, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We have been made righteous. So we have, been, we have the wisdom of God. We have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not our own, which is nothing but filthy rags. It is the righteousness of Christ so that we can boldly approach heaven in the blood. We've been washed clean. And sanctification. What sanctification means setting apart, made holy unto God, sanctified. And this really goes back to the process of salvation. We're also in a process of sanctification, being separated unto God, walking away from this world, away from all the, really, our, our own selves, our own past, our own flesh, our own desires, all that is of the natural. God rejects the natural and receives only the spiritual. We walk in by faith. And he is, of course, our redemption. He has redeemed us, purchased us by his own blood. That, according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Amen to that. We can only glory in what Jesus has done for us, never in what we have done. We are in Christ Jesus. In fact, that's what, you know, uh, being baptized, the real baptism is about. We, we talk about water baptism. That's only a symbol. The real baptism is this, is we are in Christ now. We are uh, uh, immersed. When we talk about water, you, you know, you go in the water, you come out. There's an immersion there. And so that is symbolic of the real baptism. The real baptism is salvation in Christ Jesus. We are immersed into Jesus Christ. And we come out clean, a whole new man, a whole new person. So we glory not in ourselves. We glory only in the Lord. We realize really our inability to save ourselves. And so we humbly come every day just realizing, I remember who I was. I remember my past. I remember my nature. I remember my sin. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We will spend an, an eternity in humble Praise because of God's mercy when we realize. Well, I mean, I think we're going to be able to see those that have rejected God and we'll be able to see their eternity as well. The lake of fire, I think we'll be able to, to visibly see it. The smoke of their torment, the Bible says, goes up forever. And so we'll be just so grateful and so humble and so thankful that we know we deserve that. But God had mercy. Keep going just a few minutes more into chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1, and Paul continues. He says, And I, brethren, talking to the Corinthian church, they are brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So now that we've read all that in context, this, this is a, one of my favorite verses. It's, Paul didn't come preaching with the wisdom of men. 
And, and of course, that's what so many of the Greeks were into, was standing up, giving these great speeches, using words that people didn't even understand. It's like he was, in our, in our uh, world, would, would be speaking Shakespearean English. And nobody actually talks like that. Nobody talks Shakespearean. That's not actually a language. But, but when you listen to it, you, you, know, you can't even understand a lot of it. And so, and, and that's what uh, also so many of, that's what religion always does, is it gets to a place where it talks, it talks a lot, but says nothing. It, it doesn't say anything of any value. Or it says it in a, fo in a foreign language, in Latin or something, so you can't understand it. And, and Paul rejected all that. That is of man, that is disgusting in the sight of God. He comes, Paul come, when he came preaching in Corinth, he came not with any type of wisdom of, of men declaring the testimony of God, which is another word for the gospel. He says, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You also, also have to remember that this was a, a carnal church. And so Paul wasn't going to get into the deep things with a very carnal church, right? He just wanted to break it back down to the simplest stuff. I'm preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because y'all are a bunch of carnal, divided, messed up people. You know, carnality not only uh, deals with, with, with fleshly carnality. We understand the, the flesh is rejected. Doing things in the flesh is rejected by God. But also, also carnal thinking. And that's really what he's dealing with, with, with intellectualism and, and all this Stuff with, with uh, Greek philosophy and, and, and so many people were hungry for that mess. And, and so there's a carnal, soulish realm. And he's saying, I reject the flesh operating my ministry in the flesh. I reject operating my, 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 my ministry in intellectualism as well. I'm not trying to use the biggest words I can. That's poor communication as a preacher. I'm trying to, to reach the people at their level, at their language. And so Paul would come down to where they were to help them understand. And so he, he went back to the beginning with his message and says, I'm not coming teaching you a whole bunch of deep stuff. I'm just going to teach you Jesus Christ and him crucified. And what happened, I like this part, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. So Paul, realizing that, you know, even... Later in life, he, he was in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Why? Was he afraid of people? Was he af what, did he have stage fright? No. He was afraid of operating in the flesh. He was af afraid of re reverting back to the flesh and reverting back to his soulish man, operating in intellectual. And, and so he didn't want to do that he, he, he was because he didn't want to take glory from God. He didn't want to revert back to that. He was in humble submission, operating his ministry. The, the Bible talks about you don't get reward just for, for doing things. You, you get reward, in, in other words, doing things in the flesh. You get reward for doing things as, that God told you. Doing things in the spirit. Doing things according to the will of God. So it's not just in ministry we do stuff because we can do stuff in the flesh and get no reward. We've got to do stuff according to God's Demand, according to God's command. So he says, in my speech, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. He says it over and over again. You get tired of hearing it after a while. But he's emphasizing, this was the way my ministry was. And of course, it still was. But in demonstration of the Spirit and power. And he goes on to say, and we'll not have time for it, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. But notice, I just want to emphasize this one last point. Preaching Christ and him crucified allowed Paul to operate in power. That's all you needed to preach, to operate in power. If you know the ministry of Paul, he also um, did special miracles so that from his own body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them. The evil spirits went out of them. Special miracles, and he was raised from the dead. He raised people from the dead. He did all kinds of things. And what did he preach? He just preached Christ and him crucified. That's all you need to do to operate in power. Preach Christ and him crucified. Essentially, the, the word of the gospel, the word of truth, the message of the cross. 
Hallelujah. Amen. We just got to humble ourselves. Amen. When we minister, not operate in the flesh. All right, my time is up. I'll hand it over. Praise the Lord. Um, I don't know about y'all, but that word is right on time. Um, as I was sitting and listening to uh, Pastor Thomas just open up the word, uh, it's like I felt the Lord impress on my heart that no matter what we are going through, um, whether as a body of Christ or individually in our lives, in our households, at work, uh, continue, just continue to press in to the Lord. Continue to follow him. Continue to keep your eyes on him. Um, he is the author and finisher of our faith. Um, we'd like to, uh, I think we have one announcement. We are still in need of laity speakers for October 28th. So um, as pastors say, if you are a member of our laity, our church, um, and you would like to um, uh, present a word from the Lord, uh, please see Pastor Thomas or Pastor Lincoln. Um, with that being said, uh, we have a few ways uh, we can give our tithe and offering. We have the uh, baskets against the back of the wall. Um, we have text to give, and we have our kiosk uh, outside um, in the lobby area. Also online, you can click the uh, donate button. Um, if you would, uh, please stand so we can uh, pray and dismiss. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight. We thank you so much for your engrafted word that's planted in our hearts tonight. Lord God, we ask that uh, you water that seed um, so that it may grow into something beautiful, uh, that we may mature in your son, uh, Jesus Christ. Father, as we give tonight, uh, we ask that you bless the seed of the offering and the tithes um, to uh, go to the furtherance of your kingdom and getting the gospel out there wherever it needs to go and, uh, and touch whoever it needs to touch, save whoever it needs to save. Father, as we depart from here, we ask that you be with us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for watching and please subscribe. You can also find more of our videos in our archives at ChristUnveiled.org. We'll see you next time.